<laughs> Welcome to RCR Wireless News. I'm Martha DeGrasse, and I'm joined today by Mark Thronson and Kevin Kitagawa from Imagination Technologies. Welcome, gentlemen. Hello. Thank you very much. Mark is Director of Processor Technology Marketing, and Kevin is Director of Segment Marketing at Imagination. Mark, I'd like to start with a question for you. Imagine Technology, Imagination Technologies is a longtime leader in GPU cores. The cores are found in the graphics processors in many of today's leading mobile devices, including most iPhones, iPads, and many of Samsung's Galaxy products. And since your acquisition of MIPS late last year, a lot of industry observers have been wondering and waiting about Imagination Technologies getting into CPU cores. And last week, you had an announcement about that. So if you could, I'd like you to recap that for us. Sure. Uh, actually, um, the Imagination acquisition uh, closed just uh, earlier this year. Oh, sorry. And, uh, and and so uh, well, it was announced uh, late last year. So you were you were right as far as it becoming public, but uh, it closed just earlier this year. And um, and basically, last week uh, we wanted to um, show some of the uh, the first efforts of uh, of the MIPS uh, becoming part of a imagination. And so we effectively gave a preview on the next generation of uh, of MIPS based uh, CPU cores. Uh, it's the warrior generation of devices. And uh, there's a number of uh, uh, new capabilities that uh, we aren't talking in detail about each of the individual cores, but this generation of devices uh, raises the performance bar uh, and introduces uh, uh, hardware virtualization uh, technology and uh, and high performance uh, advanced SMD uh, uh, extensions into the into MIPS cores for the first time. So obviously, the the big question is how competitive it will be with um, the cores from your fellow British company ARM. And can you talk a little bit about about how you would characterize the MIPS architecture versus the ARM architecture? Uh, sure, um, we. Uh, you know, MIPS, MIPS has uh, very historical roots dating back to the uh, origins of, uh, of RISC technology. We believe that the MIPS architecture is adhered uh, uh, very closely with uh, the traditional and, and original design principles behind RISC. Um, the new capabilities uh, for uh, virtualization and, and SIMD uh, uh, maintain that uh, you know, keep it simple. Um, the keep it simple translates to small, fast, efficient, uh, low power, uh, and uh, and and so we believe as we roll out these technologies and cores, uh, we'll maintain the high levels of efficiency that are uh, that that the MIPS architecture and the corresponding uh, CPU products are, are known for. And I'm assuming that you already have relationships with some of the, the chip makers in this space um, based on work in set-top boxes, GPUs, those, those types of, of processors, right? Uh, sure. Actually, uh, we worked with uh, some of our lead licensees in the definition of the original specs. Uh, right. You know, actually, some of those companies have already gone public with uh, their own MIPS uh, compatible uh, products, uh, uh, Avium and Broadcom being two of those companies. I'm uh, sorry, before Broadcom, what was the other name that you said? Cavium. Oh, Cavium. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. So both companies have gone public at this point uh, uh, with their networking products, making use of uh, our, the hardware virtualization technology, and uh, you'll see uh, as we. Uh, more formally roll out uh, these warrior class CPU cores uh, from imagination directly. You'll, you'll see uh, you'll you'll see much more uh, detail about uh, uh, features and and customer adoption in the future. And can you give us any information at all on on timing um, when we might actually see a product? 
so yeah, Warrior is actually a generation of uh, of CPU cores, so it's not just one product. Uh, but you'll see members of the Warrior uh, family and generation uh, rolling out later this year. But no, um, towards the end of the year, towards the fall, any any specifics there or not really? Uh, nothing further than what I just said. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, um, a couple of other topics that we want to touch on today are, are topics that your your company spoke about at a recent Lindley conference, um, heterogeneous processing, and also the importance of scalability in processor architecture today. So I'd like to start with heterogeneous processing and and what that really means and why it's so important going forward. So. Uh, would one of you like to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Uh, why don't I start? Uh, Kevin can uh, can join in and, uh, at uh, any time. Yep. But uh, yeah, basically, um, SOC development. Uh, the the the, the talk was actually um, uh, about uh, scalability and heterogeneous processing in the mobile environment. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the really the complexity of SSCs has gotten to the point where um, it's less about adding new things and more about actually taking advantage of all the different types of processing horsepower that uh, is available uh, in in uh, the technology that's being used to, uh, today. So, uh, you know, do you need um, eight CPUs in a, in a mobile phone? Um, probably not. <laughs> well, you know, um, maybe not, but then, I mean, I think that the, the octa-core, the Qualcomm octa-core, they, I mean, it, they definitely have different functions for, for doing, you know, more intensive video, for doing basic functions. I mean, they can make a good case, I think, for eight cores. Um, well, yeah, so there's different kinds of processing technology in every one of these devices. There's uh, GPU technology, there's CPU technology, there's uh, typically uh, a uh, video and even audio processing type uh, uh, engine in, inside these uh, SOCs as well. So, um, you know, whether you need so many CPUs is is debatable, but one thing I think you can say, and I think is a trend going forward, is um, uh, that the software you need to be able to take uh, better uh, use or make better use of the of the resources across the SOC uh, um, in the system. Um, uh, as, as an example, um, uh, the, a GPU is a very substantial um, Whoops, do we lose Mark? Overall die size. Um, and today it's predominantly dedicated to doing one very important function, the, the graphics and rendering to the, to the display. Uh, but uh, it has a lot more capability, and uh, and and so um, some of the initiatives in the industry uh, are all about broadening how software, general software, can make more use of all this uh, very powerful um, processing capability that's that's in today's SSCs. Okay, terrific. Okay. Kevin, did you have anything to add? Yeah, and if you look at, you know, again, uh, historically, um, the CPUs basically were extremely easy to program, you know, um, and did, for example, singular tasks, I'd say, very, very well, okay? Um, the GPUs were massively parallel, but extremely hard to program, okay? And so this HSA, or heterogeneous system architecture, allows you, for example, to actually have a system, sort of a single software sort of uh, arrangement or framework that allows you to basically to, to put tasks that run very well on CPUs onto the CPUs, tasks that are very, again, uh, run very well on, and can be massively parallel onto the GPUs itself. Okay, and again, th that's sort of the, the new wave of things. You, know, you sort of mentioned, um, again, the uh, way that sort of SLCs are actually going, 
Um, right now, for example, it is CPU and GPUs that are going to be treated as parallel. Um, historically, the CPU was sort of the master, okay, and then controlled everything else. Now the CPU and GPU, for example, are on an equal footing, okay, um, and everything else is still going to be, for example, the slaves of, of this, but you can see what the direction of where HSS, H, HSA is actually going. All right, that is very interesting. Okay, let's move on to, to scalability and why that's going to be more important going forward. Yes, yes. so um, scalability, uh, you know, not all problems are equal. Uh, not, not all applications are trying to do the same thing, but there, there is quite a bit of um, technology overlap. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a big difference between trying to connect a... Um, uh, uh, a, a, a meter to the internet um, versus uh, a tablet or a cell phone type uh, connection, um, and, uh, and 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 so really scalability at the architectural level is about having the efficiency, the underlying efficiency in in the way the uh, architecture and the and the processor implements. Um, uh, that allows it to solve both very cost-constrained applications to very, uh, you know, robust, um, very uh, compute-intensive uh, applications, and every type of uh, challenge in between. And the scalability uh, also is, you know, the, you can make the same comment as cost as you can about uh, power. Uh, it needs to be able to be very power efficient at one end and, and yet be able to deliver the, the goods and from a performance standpoint at the high end. So it sounds like maybe you're um, looking ahead to several possible M to M applications for your architecture? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you look at, in fact, many of our vendors, okay, they're already basically in that space. And again, um, microchip is actually a great example of being able to actually put 32-bit processing in all these different devices. And as these devices, these sensors, these ways to collect information, um, they can be even, for example, cameras, they're doing more and more intelligence basically at that node. Okay, And so as the intelligence needs to get a little bit smarter, then, for example, this is where, for example, you know, people like microchip can, can provide that type of solution. You know, on, at that at the end note. Okay, excellent. Any other vendors M to M applications that you can talk about right now? Um, not right now. Okay, by name, but I can tell you that that if you look across all the different sort of things from automotive to others, we actually have licensees that are starting to target that. And again, um, it, it's really putting. Again, this is what the beauty of of sort of the MIPS architecture because you know we're a, we're able to scale down, for example, up and down. Okay, from these very very low cost um, you know type of devices but still basically have that that power of on CPU compute power okay at that node all the way to the sort of the massively 64-bit parallel computing and a single for example you know um, you know I would say set of tools instructions and things to generate and be able to run across all those different devices so all of our licensees are starting to look at this you know to what is the next sort of you know step beyond for example the standard mobile you know, DTV, SDB, consumer electronics type thing. Right, lots of opportunity. Yep. All right, All right, Kevin Kitagawa and Mark Thronson from Imagination Technologies, thank you both very much for joining us today. Great, thank you thank very you much. much. Thanks for the time. All right, we'll hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.